All right, First Chronicles 26, the Lord led this upon my heart. <clears throat> uh, I'm usually uh, not confident when I preach on this one. The Lord, uh, he didn't give me something for a while, so until late at night, and then I got all the ideas in place, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah. The passage shows the porters of the nation of Israel who kept the door, and their position is a very special position. The Levites were called out by their king, David, given charge and responsibility for something very important, a doorkeeper. First Chronicles 26, verse 1. <clears throat> Concerning the divisions of the porters of the Korhites was Meshelamiah, the son of Korah, of the sons of Asaph. And the sons of Meshelamiah were Zechariah the firstborn, Jediel the second, Zebediah the third, Jathniel the fourth. Elam the fifth, Jehohanan the sixth, Elioni the seventh. Moreover, the sons of Obed-Edom were Shemaiah the firstborn, Jehazabad the second, Joab, uh, Joah the third, and Sekar the fourth, and Nathaniel the fifth. Amiel the sixth, Issachar the seventh, Pulthi the eighth, for God blessed him. Also unto Shemaiah his son were sons born that ruled throughout the house of their father, for they were mighty men of valor. <clears throat> The sons of Shemaiah, Othni and Raphael and Obed, Elzabad, whose brethren were strong men, Elihu and Semachiah. All these of the sons of Obed-Edom, they and their sons and their brethren, able men for strength for the service, were threescore and two of Obed-Edom. And Meshulamiah had sons and brethren, strong men, eighteen. Also Hosa of the children of Merari had sons, Simri the chief, for though he was not the firstborn, Yet his father made him the chief. Hilkiah the second, Tebaliah the third, Zechariah the fourth, all the sons and brethren of Hosa were thirteen. Among these were the divisions of the porters, even among the chief men, having wards one against another to minister in the house of the Lord. And they cast lots as well the small as the great according to the house of their fathers for every gate. And the lot eastward fell to Shelemiah, then for Zechariah his son, a wise counselor, they cast lots, and his lot came out northward, to Obed-Edom southward, and to his sons the house of Asupim, to Shupim and Hosa the lot came forth westward, with the gate uh, Salaketh, by the causeway of the going up, ward against ward. Eastward were six Levites, northward four a day, southward four a day, and toward Asupim two and two. At Parbar westward four at the causeway, and two at Parbar. These are the divisions of the porters, among the sons of Korah and among the sons of Merari. And as every Bible reader thinks when they read through that passage, who cares? Who cares about doorkeepers? My God does. My God thinks it's very valuable for every detail, intricate, though small and though belittling to other people, very important, God says to him. I consider it important, he says. That I want to put down every note and every detail because I find value in the littlest things that you do. And usually human beings are prone to ignore the littlest things. And that's why we don't find value when God places us into the position of a doorkeeper. Is that how you feel with your position in your Christian life? That you're just a doorkeeper? that you're not considered to be very important. It's a position a lot of people ignore. You feel like that you're the one that least con contributes to this church. You feel like that you're the one that doesn't do much. You feel like you're the one that's ignored the most, or even, sadly, and it does happen, look down upon, look down upon, because you're a doorkeeper. Nobody recognizes a doorkeeper. Nobody thinks anything special. They don't even tip the doorkeeper. They just walk by. All he does is he's nothing special. He's uneducated, they think. And that he's just a simple nobody, one of those leftovers that they hire for no good reason. And is that how you feel, Christian? A doorkeeper. <laughs> you feel like a doormat, pretty much, when they walk over you. But God considers a doorkeeper to be very important. 
A person must open the door to let the right people inside. And even if you think you're a doormat, a doormat even has a use, is to clean up the stinking stuff from people's feet. A porter, a porter. Jesus Christ fully understands that position. He thinks it's an important position, for he identified himself and his father with the porter at John 10, who lets anybody in or out. I think the door, the doorkeeper, entrance and restricting access. All of that is important to our Father in heaven. The faithfulness of a doorkeeper, can you imagine, in spite of such a lowly position, would stomach it, would put up with it, would not care what people think, would not care about how belittling his job and his task is. His task is very small, but that doorkeeper takes pride in the smallest thing that he does because that's a position that God called him to do. And no matter how small the task is that God called you to do, no matter how dirty the work is, be at that doormat and be faithful to it. And you wipe up every stinking rotten stuff and filth out of the shoes of the people here in this Bay Area. And then you let them inside the doors of salvation. Welcome the gospel to them. Welcome them inside this church and make them experience the joys of the Lord. And they'll never thank you. They'll never tip you. They'll probably forget your name, the one who led them to Christ, the one who first got them into this church, the one who played an important role in their lives, but remember, God remembers all of those little fine details. He remembers the Meshelemiahs, the Zacharias, the Jediels, the Zabadiahs, and he even knows every fine detail behind those Meshelemiah and Zechariah, for Zechariah's the firstborn, Jediel's second, Zabadiah's third, Japhneel's fourth. Yes, God keeps track of every single fine line and detail, and we'll be sure to record that in his book and reward that at the judgment seat of Christ. I would like to talk about the porters today and the faithfulness of holding doors. Will you pray with me? Father God, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Make this sermon reach the people's hearts. God, I just preach, as always, how you call me to preach. Lord, I completely yield to thee. Lord, have thine own way in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Now, verse 1, notice that God describes the divisions of the porters. More particularly, he pays attention to verse 4, this particular name. Moreover, the sons of Obedidim. You notice that? Moreover. Well, why not just say the sons of Obedidim? Why does he have to say moreover? Because it's more particular, Obedidim. Obedidim is something very special to God. A person that nearly all of us Bible readers have ignored and paid very little attention to, but God wanted us to pay attention because Obedidim would be a big blessing to the majority of us. Obed-Edom had these sons. He had Shemaiah, the firstborn, Jehazabad, the second, Joah, the third, Sekar, the fourth, and Nathaniel, the fifth, Amiel, the sixth, Issachar, the seventh, Puthai, the eighth, for God, note, for God blessed him, which is why he named all those sons that way, because God had blessed him. Did you notice when you look up the majority of his son's names. He named them that way because God blessed him. A few examples is Jehazabad, which means the Lord has given. Another example is Issachar, which means reward. See, he named every one of his boys, nearly all of them, after God's blessing. Why? For God blessed him. With such a blessing like that, 
that he experienced. King David, all he can think about and what the Lord, all he can task him with is being a doorkeeper. Belittling task, is it not, you would think? But Obed-Edom, I don't think he saw it that way. When he had all these sons lined up and he realized how much God has blessed his life, he was thanking the Lord and he named his boys after God's blessing. And the Lord, all he could do to give him and show him in return is, I want you to keep my door. But Obed-Edom, I don't think that he saw that as a little task. Instead, he continued to do with every one of his sons born. He probably took that door and said, thank you, Lord, for blessing me with this. Thank you, Lord, that my sons that you blessed me with are blessed with this, keeping the door, keeping the door. It's not a belittling thing. It's a very special thing to him. And because Obed-Edom thought it that way, God continued to bless him. If you read the life of Obed-Edom, it's very interesting how much God has blessed his life. We're going to find out, in fact, later on that Obed-Edom was such a good doorkeeper. He was such a good watcher. He was such a good sentinel that King David, at his hour of crisis, he left him the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says, the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom. Because why? He was a doorkeeper for his ark. I know that what we go through in life with the family that you have, it may seem like uh, a burden or a hassle. Sometimes parents, now come on, I mean the flesh gets in there. Sometimes the parents when they take care of these kids, they just have this horrible thought sometimes that they're like, why do I have to have a kid like you? Why does, why, Lord, why did you bless me? Why did you give me this kid? Bless you with this kid, you say? Isn't that what the Lord blessed you? Aren't there so many parents right now who are spending so much money just to adopt a child, and the child ends up to be a rascal and a burden to them? But those parents don't care because they want a child. Do you know how many parents would probably want to adopt and take care of your child that you think is a burden? Do you know how many people are still praying for a loving husband, a loving wife, someone that is a saved person? Do you know how many saved believers are here who do not have saved wives, saved husbands, and they're still praying to God? And you're fussing and you're whining about the wife and the husband God has given to you, and you think, Lord, they're not a help me to me. Lord, uh, my husband is not a good man who is gentle and loving like the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how many people are out there praying for the one that they can love and adore? Do you know how many people out there are all alone, even in the lost world, that they go through dating apps and they're still searching for the one love in their lives? Can't you take that husband and wife and say, the Lord blessed me with you. Can't you look at your children and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me children? What are they? Doormats? Just a door, right, for you to take care of? Your house is nothing special, and you're keeping the door. You're trying to be a good leader in the house. You're trying to be a good parent. And the task that you're given is just taking care of a door and your family, nobody gives a flip about. No one thinks highly of it. You're just like many broken families and broken relationships out there with broken kids out there, and no one gives a flip about you, not even your government, with all those special programs that they give. But you know God cares, and that's what he's given to you, and that's his blessing, his blessing on you. That's why you fail in being a good husband, see? You don't take your wife as your treasure, your blessing from God. See, that's why you're not faithful wife to obey your husband and submit. You don't take your husband as a blessing from God. See, that's why parents, you fail to raise your kids right and love them properly or discipline them correctly and be stern because you don't take them 
as a blessing from God. You know why you don't sign up the volunteer sheets? Do you know why you don't faithfully come? Do you know why you don't get involved in God's work? You know why you keep running away from preaching the Word of God and teaching His book? You know why you cannot fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? They're doormats to you. You belittle them. This is not God's blessing upon you. Then do you want God to take away the blessing? Because there's that verse, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. So when God takes away this church, will you still say, blessed be the name of the Lord? If you can't bless the name of the Lord right now when he gives to you, how can you bless the name of the Lord when he'll take it away from you? You know why I pastor this church with my life on it? Because this is God's blessing on me. It's a rare gem. What young person like me, young loser, young punk like me, ever gets this treasure in the Bay Area? Doormat? It's a door that I just take lightly? Or is it my blessing? I'm Obed-Edom, see? And I have my Meshulamiahs and Zacharias and Issachars, and I have my Jehozabads and Shemaiah. They're all named after God's blessing, each and every one. Each and every name that I pray for is a blessing to God for me, from God to me. Amen. And each and every person that comes to this room cannot be a burden, but a blessing from God to me. And then every task that is given in this church, every Sunday, precious Sunday, that I am to preach to you the Word of God is not a burden for me when I go through sleepless nights to prepare a message. It ain't a normal message. It's God's message. It's God's blessing to me. And how can I treat this sermon like it's some kind of doormat? It's a precious door. A precious door that I'm going to take seriously. And that's why I can be faithful to God's work you know why? I consider it my blessing. Not a burden, not a curse, not a menial task, not some everyday normal thing that I go through. And that's why you're faithless. That's why you slack off with the task God has given to you. That's why you don't value God's work and job that he has given to you, his blessing he's given to you. Because I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, sir and ma'am, I guarantee you this. If you value somebody or something that God has given to you in your life, you will waste every ounce of effort and use every strength in your body to be faithful, to protect it, and take care of it, and do everything you can to excel it. Amen. But see, you don't take it as the most blessed thing in your life. You know why you backslide in your Christian walk? You don't take it as the most valuable treasure and gem in your life. If you don't take the personal relationship with Jesus Christ that seriously, I know your social relationships with your family, friends, and lost people you're witnessing to, I know you're not taking them seriously either. The word of God reads right here in verse 6, Also unto Shemaiah his son were sons born that ruled throughout the house of their father, for they were note mighty men of valor. The sons of Shemaiah, Othni and Raphael, and Obed, Elzabad, whose brethren were strong men, Eliu and Semachiah. All these of the sons of Obed, Edom, they and their sons and their brethren, able men for strength for the service three score and two of Obed-Edom. And Meshulamiah had sons and brethren, strong men, 18. Did you note how many times the Holy Spirit noted strong men, able, strength for the task? Do you know who these people were? They're doorkeepers, do you understand? <laughs> Nothing special about Shemaiah, Othni, Reth, uh, Raphael, and 
Meshelamiah, Hosa. I mean, you and I are going to forget their names after this. I have to keep looking at that Bible to remember their names. That's how unimportant these people are. All they are is doorkeepers. But God says they're strong men, able men. You know those Levites? They minister to God's sanctuary. And they could be like the sons of Obed-Edom keeping the door. They could be like the other tribes of the Levites who offer sacrifices, who make sure that the sins of the people that they've been confessed and covered, they're the ones who make sure that certain parts of the tabernacle are clean. Some of them have the special privilege to carry the Ark of the Covenant. All of these are tribes of Levi. And didn't you know that in the Word of God, all the tribes of Israel go out to war but there is one special tribe who doesn't really have to go to war. That's Levi. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there were Levites who went out to battle. But there's a good number of them as well who had to be high priest, who had to be priests, who had to maintain the work of the Lord and the ministry. They did not have to go out to war. They did not have to go out to battle. All they had to do was just, hey, I've got the ministry of God to take care of. So why should I go out and get my hands bloody and fight the battle? Well, in this passage, the sons of Obed-Edom didn't think that way. The sons of Obed-Edom, yes, they had to be the doorkeeper. Yes, they had to take care of God's ministry. And they are faithful. And they work faithfully in the things of God. I can imagine they never skipped church. I can imagine they made sure every object in their church was cleaned and vacuumed. And they made sure that there was nothing dirty and filthy. And they made sure that as a church they would minister to each and every soul, counsel them, follow up with them, love them, pray over them. I'm sure they did everything that the best that they could, the Son of Obed-Edom, but in that work, in that ministry that they were so preoccupied and busy, they never thought for once, I do not have to get my hands dirty or go out to battle. You know what they thought? This is spiritual warfare. And I'm a doorkeeper. Do you understand? I'm a doorkeeper. That means anybody, any enemy, can walk inside God's house and his ministry and cause corruption and problems. So I must be trained. And I must fight. And I must be strong. And as doorkeepers, they had to have shields. They had to have their armor. They had to have the whole armor of God. And their spears and their swords. And they had to learn how to fight. They had to learn to bleed. They had to learn to suffer. They couldn't just say, hey, I'm working in God's ministry. So I don't have to sweat. I don't have to suffer. I don't have to get my hands dirty. I don't have to fight. All I can do is working. I, all I can do is work in God's ministry and I'll be fine. You are in fantasy land. How can... The son of Obed-Edom, who is a doorkeeper for the Lord, think that as long as I come to church, as long as I wash the dishes, vacuum, and as long as I preach and teach on the pulpit, and as long as I do my minister ministerial duties, get involved faithfully in God's church, I don't have to suffer. I don't have to fight. I don't have to be strong. How can any doorkeeper think like that? Listen, you ready? We got Bible believers who are willing to clean toilets. Praise the Lord, amen. Only in charismatic services it won't be like that. Charismatics, they want all the attention. Me, look at me how I preach and prophesy. <laughs> Bible believers are willing, willing to not get any attention, willing to clean the toilets, willing to do anything for the church and work faithfully in God's ministry but Bible believers are not ready to suffer for it. They're not ready to sweat it out. They're not ready to fight. Listen, fight to get here, to clean the toilet, to vacuum, to be a blessing to somebody. They're not willing to fight and suffer for that. You think you can clean toilets for the Lord without fighting for it? I know that sounds silly, but it's true. 
You all know that. You've been in the, if you've been in this church for a long time, or if you've been, as soon as you got saved and you got involved in this church, I know nearly all of you went through some demonic attack, went through some hardship and trial. So you need to hear this. I know you love this ministry. You want to be faithful. So you know what? Fight for it. Suffer for it. Grit your teeth for it. Pray to God like you never prayed to God. Fast for it. Go through sleepless nights and don't get any peace about it until you fight for it and you suffer for it and do it for God. And if you have to fight to be a doorkeeper and to be a doormat to clean people's stinking feet, fight for it. Jesus fought for it. He fought for it. He died on the cross to wash somebody's stinking feet. <laughs> That's something, right? He died and bled for you so that he can wash you, your feet. You're not washing his feet. He's washing your feet. <laughs> That's convicting right there, man. That's convicting right there. He bled, he suffered, he sweated it out so that he can clean your stinking feet and mine. And he's faithful. He's an advocate to the Father. He never rests day or night. And when we confess our sins to him, he's right there. When we have a problem and we need to pour it out to them, he's right there. Oh, all the time. Thank you, Jesus, that you wash my dirty stinking feet. And you have to die on the cross to accomplish that for me. Because he, if he never died on the cross, I would have never been saved. And if I never gotten saved, Jesus Christ would not minister on my behalf today. You know what faithfulness is? Suffering for the littlest, belittling, ignorant task. You don't think the Bay Area is a <laughs> belittling place? It's one of the most looked down areas in the world. You know which state is picked upon more than any other state in the United States of America, good godly America? Stinking California. How many times that, I mean, you know your pastor travel around so many places. How many purple, how many purples, how many, yeah, that's the California spirit in me, I guess. I don't know. How many people have heard about California and they said, man, it's a good godly place there. They all fear God. How many associate a rainbow color with that one? How many people associate sexual perversion with that? Marijuana and godless liberal depravity with that. You know what that is? That is a stinking doormat. Who wants to wash the feet of a bunch of alphabet soup club? But Jesus died for them. Yeah, that's right. And maybe I should die for them too. Win them to Christ. Preach against their sin. Not apologize and fight and suffer. Fight and fight and fight and suffer because this is my door. God gave me an open door right here. And some of you have been with me at the beginning and I better fight for it. I better bleed for it. And if I go street preaching by myself, soul winning by myself, and I pray alone on a Wednesday night prayer meeting, then it will be worth it all when I see Jesus Christ because this is my door that he gave to me. And I'll be faithful. And will God find me faithful in it? I must die for it. I must sweat for it. I must fight for it. And how many people have wiped their feet on my face? But you know what? This doorkeeper's got to keep that door open for some soul to get saved and walk in. And when I see some of you, oh my goodness, who walked inside the door later on, it brought the greatest joy in my heart. And I said, Lord, I'll keep this door open for you. Yeah, I think so. Doorkeeper, do you got that joy? Come on, Did someone wipe their feet off your doormat and you saw them walk inside where they became a Bible believer? Where they got saved because of you, doorkeeper? <laughs> you willing to fight for that? To suffer for that? The Bible says right here, Able men for strength for the service. See, you cannot continue on God's work and service. This church will not continue without strength. Without people, spirits willing to fight and suffer. This church will not go on. This church will not go on. 
You want to be fit for, listen, you know who we are? I'm not trying to put us up on a pedestal, but I'm trying to tell everybody who has a Bible-believing church, and they need to recognize who they are. This is a Bible-believing church in a wicked area. If you want to serve God in a place like this, you need to be strong. Now, the Bible says right here in verse 10, also, Hosa of the children of Merari had son, Simri the chief. For though he was not the firstborn, yet his father made him the chief. Hilkiah the second, Tebaliah the third, Zechariah the fourth. All the sons and brethren of Hosa were 13. Among these were the divisions of the porters, even among the chief men, having wards one against another to minister in the house of the Lord. God will not stop naming names because he believes each and every name is important. He says Hosa is important. Morari is important. Also, their children are important. Hilkiah is important. Zechariah is important. And I know there's an ugly number 13 at verse 11. But God thinks, no, uh, you know, I think that's important too. And he puts all of these people as very important, necessary things to maintain the door because each and every one of those so-called unnecessary names and small details that we don't give a flip about is a ward against each other. See that verse? Ward against each other. You know what ward is? That's that doorkeeper. That's that watcher. That's the sentinel. That's the one keeping guard. I'm telling you, I know that Hilkiah is not important. But guess what? Hilkiah is important because he's a ward for Tebaliah. And I know Tebaliah is not important, but Tebaliah is important because he's a ward for Hilkiah. You see, as doorkeepers, we not only take our posts, our positions very lightly, but we also take other doors very lightly that God has given to us. Each and every sentinel and doorkeeper we should not look down upon for each and every doorkeeper is very important because they're a ward for you. And in return, you're a ward for them. Was that archaic King James to you? Let me translate. Each and every doorkeeper that you belittle And let's say it could be Bible reading and prayer. I know, it's not much you feel like. And everybody does. It's just a normal thing that I go through every day. But that thing is a guard, a protection award for you, the doorkeeper, on what you're currently doing. Trying to go to church as much as you can. Because if you don't read your Bible and pray, you won't eventually come to this church. But guess what? If you don't come to church either, and then you say, well, here's my door. I got to read my Bible and pray. Read my Bible and pray. I don't care how much you read the Bible and pray. If you don't go to church, that won't protect, that won't guard your Bible reading and prayer life. How do I know that? Because I know that sometimes the preaching here gets you back to your Bible reading and prayer. (laughs) Gets you to take your Bible reading and prayer more seriously. Maybe change some things the way you talk to God and he talks to you. See, they're a guard against each other. Family is unimportant to you. This church is unimportant to you. They're doormats. My friend, they were probably your ward. They were your protection and guard for the current duty that you're doing for God. What did God call you to do currently? Is it to just be a wife? To be a good, submissive wife to the husband in the work of the Lord? Is it to be God's preacher when the pastor is absent? To preach the very best that he could. To teach the very best that he could. Make sure that he prays up, reads the Bible, make sure sins are taken care of before he teaches that book, preaches that book. 
and takes it so seriously, he's willing to spend endless nights on it to give the most spirit power filled preaching and teaching to God's people right here. Is that your task? Well, you will fail even being a normal, submissive wife. You will fail even being God's man to preach on that pulpit. You will fail in your current task if you don't have other protections and guards in your life. You know why you don't take other protections and guards in your life? Because they're doormats to you. And if you treat those things doormats, then your current duty is a doormat to you. That's why wives feel like they're doormats when they do their role for God and they don't take that as a treasured, listen, treasured, valuable position. Whew, that's something right there, right? And the man won't take this as a treasured value position to preach God's word. Listen, and they treat this like a doormat message. If you treat the other wards in your life that God has given to you to be your protection, to be your guard, and you treat those things at doors as doormats, the current duties you're doing for God, I promise you, you will treat that as a doormat too. But if you take those things as valuable and say, no, they're not little things. I need to get right with God and cast off that sin out of my life. That sin is really hindering me in my walk with God. That sin is making me lose energy and sleep and the motivation and the peace in my mind and in my heart. And it's interfering with my current duties for God. And sin in even interferes with just the normal duty of waking up early in the morning and working effectively in your job and just even making money. Why? Because... Sin wasn't a serious thing to you. It's a doormat. It's something to take lightly. When God says avoid sin and avoid this sin and appearance of evil, not just sin, but appearance of evil, you treated it like a doormat and said, it's not a big deal. No, staying away from sin is your ward, is precious and valuable. And it will be a protection for you against depression. Against guilty feelings in your conscience and heart that wells up. That's how important that ward is, staying away from sin. That's how important it is to take care of your family and your house. But why? You know, I'm doing well in the ministry. People think that I'm a great brother, a great sister, a great preacher. I'm doing a good job in the church. As 1 Timothy 3 says, how can he take care of the church if he fails to take care of his house? You think that you can work in God's house if you can't work even in your house? That's a war. That's a protection factor for you. If you get your marriage life straightened out, your parenting straightened out, then guess what? It will straighten out the way you take care of the church. It's a protection factor. It's a ward for your other duty. And guess what? Your current duties right now, even if it's just working in some normal job, that is also a guard for your Bible reading, prayer life, and your work in the ministry. Well, how is my business job award <laughs> uh, for my uh, ministry uh, work? How can a business job be the same thing as a ministry job? Because if you're faithful to show up in your workplace, if you're faithful to make sure you know what pleases your boss, if you make sure that you work long hours and hard and you can put up with divisions and strife in the workplace and traffic and all that, with your business job, <laughs> if you do well on that one, that will be a guard and a help factor for you in God's work and ministry he gives to you. See, each of these things God gives to you is a ward against each other. It's a guard. It's a protective factor. It's a helpful factor against each other. But see, if you treat one of them like a doormat, if you treat one of them lightly, it's contagious. It'll affect the other one. And you're going to take the other one lightly. You're going to take the other one a doormat. And that's why probably your current duty you're doing now for the Lord, 
your current door that you're protecting and you're trying to work hard at, you lost thankfulness, you lost the blessing of God in it, you treated it lightly, and you look down on it, and you want some other door to watch. You want a better job out there. You want another better life out there. God, why can't you make things easier like that person and that person? Don't look at anybody else's door. Look at yours. You got one that's a ward against another? Do you got some things in your life that are reciprocal and help each other? Or you got a broken chain somewhere? You got a broken link. And that's why you're having a hard time connecting the pieces in your life together. Verse 13. And this is very important, you want to hear. Verse 13. And they cast lots, as well as the small as the great, according to the house of their fathers for every gate. You know what the most important thing is? They cast lots. No, I'm not encouraging you to play poker again and gamble and stuff like that. That's not what I'm trying to say. That's not the most important thing in your life. You know why they casted lots right here? They want to see whose task God will give to the certain Levites. You notice that at verse 14, the lot eastward fell to Shelemiah, then for Zechariah his son. His lot came out northwards to Obed-Edom southward. Verse 16, Shupim, host of the lot, came forth westward. Now, didn't you know that if you took out verse 13, they can still choose what position they have to take care of. They can choose whatever task that they want to. You know that? Why do they have to cast lots? All right, let's cast lots right here. All right, let's see what task you want. Imagine we did that at the volunteer sheet. You know what volunteer sheet means? You put your free will in there, and I want this task, and I want that hour and that time. You know, maybe it will save us a lot of trouble if we start casting lots, amen? Maybe we should start doing that. It'll work out building character a bit, you know? Let's put toilet cleaning right here, and let's put security work on Sunday, 4.30 in the morning, and then, you know, clean up the church uh, up to 11 p.m. midnight. Oh, but I can't. I got this and that and that. Maybe we'll build character if we just cast lots right there. Yeah. And then whatever the Holy Spirit chooses you to do and you pick up the task and you say well God called me to do this <laughs> maybe we should start doing that builds character but <laughs> yeah good <laughs> I got one yes right here <laughs> this is how unpopular the vote is <laughs> next next Sunday at the blowout imagine we've casted lots right all right who wants to clean what you know <laughs> let's see if they really got right with God <laughs> Obviously, your pastor won't be one of them to pick the lots. I'll just pass around the basket. <laughs> Isn't it strange? They have to cast lots. They could just pick whatever tasks that they chose. Listen, that they want to do for God. But no, they said, Lord, listen. Lord, Whatever you choose for me, I'll do it. Please don't let it be. Please don't let it be. Oh, God, please. No, 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 no. Please don't let it be, Lord. Please don't let it be, Lord. Please don't let it be. Please don't. No, 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 no. Oh, no. No, I don't want to do it. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. Cleaning toilets again. No. Yeah. Taking out the trash. No, that's Max's job. No. That's your life, ain't it? That's your life. Anything goes. You don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen to you today. And life is like that. It could be a car accident after this church service. It could be, maybe I need to stay longer after church and encourage somebody right there. Maybe it's 
There are some things in my heart and in my house I need to take care of. Maybe it's, I don't like that brother and sister, but I got to go to that brother and sister, talk with him or her, encourage him or her. And I don't like this, but I think I got to give more money than I'm used to giving. Whatever the lot is, anything goes in this life. But God picks it for you. And he picks the right thing for you. Whatever suffering, whatever blessing, whatever task God gives to you, anything goes. And see, this is called faith. Do you understand that? When you're putting your hand in the lot here and closing your eyes and you don't know what it is. And you wonder if it will be a dreadful tomorrow or a, a wonderful thing tomorrow. And all you're doing is just by faith picking whatever God tells you to do. And then you just open it up and accept it and say, thy will be done. I will do it. Here am I. Send me. <clears throat> Come on. Th is it always here am I, send me, when certain tasks are an option for you to choose, you to pick? Life doesn't work like that, friend. It's a lot. It's the lot right here. And all these names and these tasks and all these trials and temptations, problems, they're all being scattered and they're all going everywhere and you don't know which one's which. And then here it is, they shake it up and then God says, all right, put your hand by faith and close your eyes. You don't know what it is. Now pick it up and whatever it is, you do it. You do it. You know what it is? Listen, I'm going to be careful when I say this, but it is kind of true. When you write your name on a volunteer sheet, the instinct of the flesh is, I want to help out the church. I want to please the Lord, so let me choose which option that is more comfortable for my flesh that I can do for the Lord. And you think that because you do such a good job in that task that your flesh chose that you're a faithful servant of God. You know what a faithful servant is? <sighs> Whatever, Lord. And I'll be faithful to that. And you pick it up. Now, how many times have you yielded? Listen, how many times have you yielded to the Holy Spirit guiding you on what to do, and you faithfully did that task, not your flesh choosing it. How many times before you volunteered or cleaned up or did anything in the church, you prayed to the Holy Spirit? Show me what to do, God. Bless it, Father. Have me fully surrender. Put your hand of blessing on it. If you don't yield to the Holy Spirit first, if you don't pray first, then listen, all the renovations we've done and all the preparations for the blowout that we have done is all the work of the flesh. But I sweat it. I worked hard. I worked long hours. Flesh, that's your flesh. Flesh, flesh, flesh. I don't care how much money you gave to this church. I don't care how many long hours you've done. That was all the work of the flesh. Because you didn't give it to the Lord. You didn't pray to him. You didn't yield to him. Because a lot of times the tasks that you feel like that you're supposed to faithfully do for the Lord, the Lord might change it. A lot of times the tasks that you do for the Lord, if you don't pray or yield to God, there's no Holy Spirit in it when you're working. How many times have we, Christian, yielded in the supernatural, spiritual realm when we are doing our physical tasks for the Lord? No, you yielded to the physical realm, haven't you? Physical willpower, physical fleshly comfort, strength level. Physical wisdom, physical intellect, physical talent to do that work for the Lord. See, I don't care how well you play the piano. I don't care how well you sing. I don't care how well you play a certain music. And I don't care how well you preach. It's flesh without Holy Spirit.
spirit in it. You know why you're not faithful to God's work? A flesh can only go so far. The flesh has an expiration limit. And what you feel in your heart after a summer camp or a revival meeting could just be fleshly emotions, and that can only go for so long. What you need. What you need is to pray when you start your day. Yield to the Holy Spirit as you do every single thing in your life. Cast lots before you choose a task to choose a door that you're supposed to take care of. Cast lots first. But I can preach good. I can teach good. The Lord blessed this so far I can do well. Yeah, so can Obed-Edom without casting lots. Obed-Edom can keep the door well, any task in the tabernacle well. I guarantee they're over-talented. They're over-skilled. And because of that, they don't need prayer. They don't need yielding of the Spirit. But the flesh can only go so far. You know one thing I learned with all the degrees, all the studies, all the knowledge that I have and years of pastoring and blah, 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 soul saved and fruits that God has given to me? You know one thing I've learned? I could probably still get away with it and preach you a good message and give you a good teaching, but I know this, there's no Holy Spirit power in it! You know what I need to do? I need to yield to the Spirit as I preach his book. The Bible says at verse 14 through... 19, <coughs> and the lot eastward fell to Shelemiah, then for Zechariah his son, a wise counselor, they cast lots, and his lot came out northward to Obed-Edom southward, and to his sons the house of Apum, uh, Asupim, to Shupim and Hosa the lot came forth westward, the gate Shalaketh by the causeway of the going up, ward against ward, eastward were six Levites, northward four a day, Southward for a day, and toward Asupim two and two, and Parbar westward for at the causeway, and two at Parbar. These are the divisions of the porters among the sons of Korah and among the sons of Marari. <laughs> if there's one place you don't want to go, any task or position you don't want to be put in, it ain't north. North is a positive direction in the Bible. It ain't uh, westward. If you go east to west, that's a good direction. And there are many other things here that the Levites were in tasked, uh, they were tasked with, they were entrusted with. But there's one thing nobody wants to go through, and that's south. No one wants to go down south. South is such a lowly place to go. Do you know who that was given to at verse 15? Obed-Edom. He was given the task to go down south. Ain't it great on the mountaintop, God? No, you need to go down to the valley. You need to go south. That's where I called you to do. No one wants to go south. Didn't you know south is a negative connotation in the Bible? There are many times in the Bible south is a negative connotation. Abraham, he went south when he wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to stay in the promised land. If you look at other passages in the Bible, they went down south, and that's not really a good direction. You want to go north. But you know what's interesting about south? The Bible says, I forgot what passage it was, but when it talks about the second advent, you know what the Word of God says? When he comes to save his nation of Israel, he will come with the south wind. I, even, I think also, even in the book of Daniel, do you remember it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south? To my knowledge, one time in there somewhere, king of the south, that area, that direction is positive for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his second advent. 
South ain't a good direction to go. Down in the valley, down in the suffering. Things in your life go down south and all plans and expectations go south. And then your heart feels like it's up in the north during a revival meeting and then it just lands hard straight down south. When you're alone, when you're out in the world, when you're fighting God's battle, your emotions feel south. And no matter how much you lift it up, you can't put it up. It just aims southward. Why? Because you're open Edom, and that's where God called you to go. But my friend, it doesn't matter if south is a negative direction. When the Lord Jesus Christ is in it, he uses the south wind. He uses the south direction to accomplish his purpose. When you go down in suffering... When your emotions, listen, hit hard south, that's when Jesus gets in. And he shows you something, right? He shows you something when you're like this. See, your head is hanging south. And Jesus, that's when he steps in and he shows Things about me. Things in the world around me with the people that I have encountered. You know why south is important? Because my head is bowed low as I pray to God. And that's when God shows me something when my head finally hangs southward. And I give it all up to God. When my head hangs southward because I'm reading that book and my tears through that force is just hanging southward and just keeps falling on the pages of the word of God, that's when God speaks to me and God comforts my heart, lifts up my soul, shows me something that I need. It's south. It's south. That's where Jesus is at. Is your life going southward? Good news. You'll find Jesus very soon. You'll see him more clearly. You know that song, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus? See, you just need a little bit of south. You need to go a little bit more south. Hear me, you need to travel south more. You need to go south further. Isn't that cold enough? Isn't that hard enough? No, you need to go south further. And the further south that you go, the more clearly you'll see the face of God and God the Holy Spirit guiding your life and Jesus will seem more real to you if you want everything to be worth it all when you see Jesus, keep traveling south, brother and sister in Christ. You're heading toward the right direction. Every time you go south, you always think you're in the wrong direction. When you go down south, you keep saying, am I lost? Am I lost? God, I'm confused. Oh, is this the right path? I don't know what to do. Oh, I don't know if this is... Oh, what am I going to do as you go down south? You're walking by faith here, and every... Listen, some of you need to hear this. Listen, the darker you go down, the bleaker and the more cold the winter becomes as you go down south, and it seems more wrong to you, you're heading closer to Jesus Christ. You are still heading toward the right direction. Some of you need to hear that. Let me repeat it again. You are still going in the right direction. You are. Let me show you 1 Samuel 6. 2 Samuel 6, excuse me. 2 Samuel 6. And I'm done. 2 Samuel 6.
David had a joyous moment in the Lord. And all the priests and all the Levites. There was a man named Uzzah as well. Everything was going fine. Man, their life was going uphill, not downward. They were rejoicing in the Lord. You know why? Because they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. They're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. So they're so excited. Look at verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. He just wants to help out the Lord. He wants to be faithful as a good servant. Life is going grand. And then verse 7, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark. And David was displeased. Oh, change of atmosphere, change of direction. You ain't going north any, anymore, you're going south. Emotions are not high, they're low. Displeased. The tone changed. Because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. Oh, and everything's going south. When everything is lost, and everything's going bad, who can be entrusted to take care at this hour of need when everything is going downhill? Last part of verse 10. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Oh, Obed-Edom. He was always going south, wasn't he? In my south moment, I can entrust him with that. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. Look at this. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. That's where you're going to find the blessing of God, my friend, is south. When things go south. Let me add this one too. When Obed-Edom was given the lot to take care of southward of God's temple and house, you know where that direction was? If you read 2 Chronicles, when the pagan kings conquered Israel, <clears throat> or I think it was Josiah that conquered and uh, wrecked some parts in Judah, the Bible says they carried the treasures of the Lord outside of Obed-Edom's territory. You know what was southward of the temple that Obed-Edom was taking care of? The finest treasures of God. That even the unbelievers, pagan kings and wicked people and the devil knew where to find At south, there's that treasure. At south, that's God's blessing. And at that hour of need, when things are going south, will you be the Obed-Edom entrusted to minister and take care of something in the hour of need? You know why some people can't feel like that there's anyone they can turn to here? Because when things go south, there are no people they can trust in their hour of need. You know why people live in a day and age where they feel like they're not loved enough? Because everything's going south and they have no people they can entrust in their hour of need. That's where the treasure of the Lord is, is south. But when things are going high and things are rejoicing and everything is good, everybody wants to go there. And everybody, listen... Everybody wants to take care of the ark of God when things are going well. When people are praising and rejoicing. But didn't you know it costed Uzzah his life? 
But he was faithful. He was trying to prevent the ark of God from falling off the cart. And he's trying to do the work of the Lord when things are going great, when they're praising the Lord. Yeah, but a lot of times, and you do know this too, sometimes you can get lost in all the praise and all the hype and all the positive feelings that you have for the Lord in your zeal for God. And then you make all, you sometimes make mistakes that you regret and you can't change the past. Due to unwise zeal. Due to positive feelings that you think were from the Lord, but then it costed you your life, your testimony. When you're faithful when things are going uphill, that's just asking for a catastrophe to happen eventually. But when you're faithful when things go south, and the ark of God is just sitting there, Obed-Edom... He wasn't like Uzzah with unwise zeal. Well, I want to serve God. I want to do things for the Lord. No, he was already sensitive to the guiding of the Holy Spirit first. Yielding to the Spirit first. Later on, it was proven when they casted lots. Obed-Edom did not touch that ark. I know that. You know what Obed-Edom did? I've always been used to guarding things well, protecting things well. The small things that God has given to me, those are my orders. That ark, I'm not going to do anything more or touch it or get overzealous and do something. No, it's the simple thing, stupid. I know what my orders are. Doorkeeper, porter, and just watch that ark of God. That's all he did. He just watched the ark of God. He didn't have to do something extra to get God's blessing. No, it could cost you your life if you're not careful. You know what he did? He just went by his orders that were clear. Watch. And he got God's blessing just like that. The problem with Christians today is that they're very faithful, zealous. And don't get me wrong, we need some more of that. But you're only doing that, one, when things are going uphill, see? That's why it's easy to do that, to get more motivated, to get, give more money in the missions and get involved in campaigns and uh, getting involved in the blowout and stuff like that when things are going uphill. If you do that, God's blessing won't be really real to you. It won't stick for life. Number two, when you do things extra out of zeal, that's not really faithfulness there. It's just going by feelings, and you can get yourself hurt one day real soon. Azza, are you Azza? Or are you Obed Edom? Faithful in being. Thank you. Person walks in, just guarding, protecting the door. He didn't have to do anything extra or hard. God's blessing just came to him like that. People are working extra hard to get God's blessing. But let me tell you, friend, that's not how you're going to get God's blessing. How you get God's blessing is what he told you to do. And I don't care how small it is or how belittling it is, it's that important to God. Just let the ark of God sit there. But I need to do something more. More souls need to get saved. I need to do something more. I need to do something more. No, let the ark of God sit there and do its work. You just stand still and see God move. And you do your task. The ark of God must be guarded. You know what's more valuable than the ark of God? You got God inside your heart. Are you guarding that? That's your job, doorkeeper. And if you would do the simplest things like that, not a fancy teaching, not doing something extra hard for the church or extra money, just faithfully being a doorkeeper and preventing the wrong thoughts, the wrong feelings from contaminating the ark of God in you. Amen, you know what the Bible calls this thing in you? It's not really a thing even though the Bible calls it a holy thing. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hidden treasure in our earthen vessel. Your job is to watch it. 
and let it do its work. And when that ark does its work and says, prevent this from contaminating it, you need to prevent it from contaminating it. And when the ark of God is doing its work, you've got to yield. You've got to watch. You've got to see what that ark of God is doing. That's what Obed-Edom do. Uh, Obed Edom did. He had to keep looking at the Ark of God. You know that, right? He's a watcher. He had to keep watching the Ark of God. If you watch God every day as you read his book, as you pray, as you do your normal job, busy, hectic, million things in this world and life, but those things are crucified and dead to you, and you kept looking at Jesus Christ in you instead, you might find a soul out there that you need to lead to salvation. You might find something that you need to do in this church. You might find something that you need to work on more. If you were to see Christ in you, not Gene Kim, it's easy to look at him. Look at Christ in you right now, Obed-Edom. And what is he telling you in this message? What is he showing you in this message? Then maybe if you watch a little harder... In what God is trying to tell you in this sermon, the ark of God can finally land its blessing on your life. Or are you going to be Uzzah coming to church, signing up volunteer sheet, you know, playing the instruments, practicing, cleaning up, and then, you know, soul winning when it's soul winning time, street preaching when it's street preaching time, doing my normal duties and business and taking care of family, and ah! then you're going to kill yourself, Uzzah. You know what you need to do? You need to watch and see what God is leading you to do. Step by step, day by day. And you fight one complication at a time through these means. And then God's blessing can finally fall. Well, it's doing nothing. It's doing nothing. I got to do something. That always brings a problem. You always kill yourself when you do that. I don't care how long it sits. The longer the ark of God sits there and the longer you watch, you might be surprised blessings fall during the waiting. Now, what you need today from God, Obed-Edom, what you need today is see the ark of God. Will you come on the altar and will you see the ark of God, God showing you something, God telling you something. Will you put dead the things to you that you put behind before you came to this church? I don't know what problems you went through or what your flesh is so prone to. It's time to deprogram that, put that aside, <coughs> and then watch and look at Jesus Christ in you this time and see what he's trying to tell you and show you. You need to clean that up. You need to do this for me. It's time to get all these stupid distractions out there, out of the way, and take a closer look and just watch the door, Obed-Edom. Watch and see God move. Or are you going to be Uzzah again and go around touching things and doing things that your hands are so used to touching and doing and just kill your body all over again? Every head bow and every eye shut.